Thank you everybody for joining us today. I'm Dr. Orlando Landrum from Cutting Edge Health. And today we're gonna to be talking about how your brain can change with pain as we so showed you. So we're gonna to explain to you a little bit about those different things that take place. We're gonna to explain to you different parts of the brain, how it interrelates with a lot of different things of what we've talked about before for different treatments. And really we're gonna hopefully be able to break this down so that you can be able to understand it. What many people think about is when they think about brain and they think about pain, they think about headaches and kind of having that sensation of feeling pain that's there, right? But at the end of the day, it's not so much headaches that we're talking about. We're talking about how pain can affect the actual structure of your brain, which in some ways is pretty darn scary. So for many people, they kind of feel like, man, you know what? If that really impacts my brain, then how can it be able to have a whole host of different problems that can result, right? And not to make this be scary, but the fact of the matter is it certainly can. So when we talk about brain and we talk about what it is that we're dealing with, one of the things that we need to know is exactly what are the different parts of the brain that are giving you issues, that are giving you problems, and how does it work? So when we look at the brain, we know that the frontal lobe is associated with planning, with organizing, with problem solving, things along those lines. We know that the motor cortex is associated with movement. The sensory cortex is what processes what it is that we feel physically. The parietal lobe is what we are able to perceive and how we can be able to do various different things like arithmetic and spelling. The sipital lobe is associated with vision. The temporal lobe is more memory, understanding, and language. And the medulla obligata is dealing with more breathing, heart, and respiratory rate, right? So all those different things that we've heard people use language before and kind of say, oh, all right, fancy names for the brain, they all have their roles. But what if we affect all those different roles? When we think about the brain as a, as a whole, historically, when we talk about brain movement, sensation, and feeling, and those type of things, normally it's dealing with something that's called the homunculus. And so the homunculus is a strip that is both cortical or motor cortex, as well as sensory or the somatosensory cortex. And this picture kind of shows a representation of the different parts of your body, everything from your foot to your leg, over to your hand, to your face, and how it goes along the strip and what you feel and perceive. And normally what we would think is when you have a problem with something like that, that that is what the underlying cause is, that that issue, if you have a problem with the brain, that's what you really feel. And what we see is that's not necessarily the case. It's not dealing with the homunculus. It's much broader than that. When we think about how the brain can be impacted, how it can cause various different issues, sometimes we think about, well, what happens to the brain, specifically gray matter, as we age? And there's a number of studies that have looked at it. 
So there's studies like this that have say, hey, let's look at growth charts for the brain in order to be able to understand what happens as we age. And some of those things look like the following. So as we mature, we can see going from age three up to kind of those ages of 28, you can see that there's changes in the brain that are positive. And as we start to get more mature, we can see that gray matter start to decrease. And so for many people, they'd ask, OK, well, I get what you're saying, but you're using a lot of fancy terms. I don't really understand some of those things. Can you help explain that to me? So take a look at this picture real quick for a second. So imagine that you have kind of a normal aging brain that has some atrophy. And over here, you see this picture with Alzheimer's where you see this major changes that take place. So showing that again, these changes where that gray matter, that pink structure in this picture reduce. And it can happen in multiple different areas. It can happen with areas that deal with language, that deal with memory. And by the same token, it can also happen when we talk about things that are associated with mood, depression, and other things that really are important parts of how do we deal with the brain as a whole. If you've watched some of our other videos that have talked about depression, one of the things that we've talked about is the specific part that's called the areas of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. I know that's a mouthful. Bear with me. I'm going to explain it so that you can be able to understand it. But at the end of the day, I just want you to know we're going to get there. You're going to understand it and you're going to have an idea. So just know I'm just starting. I'm just getting warmed up. So we're going to make it happen for you so that you understand exactly what it is that I'm talking about. OK, so going back to that, this dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is kind of the front portion of the brain. So this is the front back. Here's the back. And it has a whole host of different things that are involved. But for those of you who know, you know that this area is certainly sometimes associated with depression. And we've seen that in different studies where we can see this prefrontal cortex and it being related to depression, anxiety, and sometimes even heart disease. And for those of you who are my real science buffs, who are my docs and my nurses and people who are like that, like, well, that kind of looked more like an article. It comes from this overactivation of primate sublineal cingulate cortex enhances the cardiova cardiovascular behavioral and neural responses to threat. So there is science behind what we're telling you, but we will also want to make, it, make you be able to understand what's going on, right? So we're looking at this prefrontal cortex. We see that there's an issue with it within the context of pain and depression, and that is what's unique. So when we take a look, one of the things that we have seen in some studies are the following is some brain areas can have changes due to chronic pain. And what are some of those areas? It's that kind of picture that I just showed you just a second ago, but represented with another cartoon, it looks like this. So you can see that PFC over here up front that's called prefrontal cortex, but all of these areas have an interaction with the brain, everything from the thalamus and other pieces. When we take a portion of that article so you can understand what it is that I'm talking about, it says the following. The prefrontal cortex is responsible for the cognitive evaluation of pain. And so there's different parts of it that can give you different elements of what you feel from everything from the medial prefrontal cortex, the dorsal lateral, and the orbital frontal cortex. But at the end of the day, these areas are significant and can cause different problems. So how do we see pain cause problems like this? So if you take a look at this article, it says, Gray matter abnormalities in patients with chronic primary pain, a coordinate-based meta-analysis. So again, we got the fancy words, right? So what exactly are we talking about when we talk about this? In essence, what we're saying is we're going to explain this to you so that your little brain and my big brain and my little brain and your big brain aren't going to explode. So we can understand this and kind of wrap our hands around it, right? So at the end of the day, what we're talking about is that this area that's the gray matter so again the gray matter are structures that have cell bodies in them they are what the main portion is versus the white matter which is more the axons so these areas that link look kind of pinkish and brownish here these are the areas that are actually being lessened with that constant exposure to pain and there's a number of different parts of the brain that have these problems. So when we take a look at this article, we can see that they have been able to see parts with gray matter concerns that look everything from the insula to anterior cingulate to portions of the thalamus and other components 
But what we really see is that in addition to those areas, we see that there's changes in the prefrontal cortex that really can give us a problem and an issue that results in us having both pain and sometimes maybe some challenges with mood as well, as we've talked about. So is that the only article that talks about how the brain can actually be affected by pain? It's not. So gray matter loss can occur with fibromyalgia, and you can see kind of this premature aging of the brain. And what they did was they looked at similar structures and they were able to see the same type of thing where you see this gray matter loss that occurs with chronic exposure to pain. And taking a step back for a second, to me, I think this is incredibly distressing. It's one of the few things that we don't talk about all that much as pain physicians. We don't say, oh, well, you know, if we're kind of just maintaining this, if we're just trying to keep it under control, um, it's going to be okay. No, not when you have other associated symptoms and other problems that can occur because we're just managing the pain and we're not trying to necessarily treat it. So what can we do to be better, right? Well, one of the things that they did in this fibromyalgia study is they analyzed, did it affect maybe the gray and white matter um, at the same time? What they saw was the following is no, if you can see this little asterisk here, which may be difficult to kind of make out. So the FM is fibromyalgia patients and the white bar is control. For the most part, white matter was normal, CSF was normal, total volume of the brain was decreased and importantly, gray matter was decreased with fibromyalgia. And it made it so that those individuals that had this chronic pain had more likelihood of having a brain that was quote unquote older, that was aged, where you really started to feel like some of your cognitive faculties weren't as great as what it could have been. And maybe it's interrelated to also how you experience pain and how you might your mood may be experienced as well. Are there other studies that support this? There are. So studies like this that look at complex regional pain syndrome that have been able to show that it has changed structural association with the brain. And you can be able to see that complex regional pain syndrome, also called CRPS, can change gray matter atrophy. And as you can see in this article, not trying to kind of belabor this point, but it makes reference to DLPFC. And what does that stand for? It stands for the same thing that we talked about earlier when we looked at this portion of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which has a huge piece to play in talking about pain and talking about mood and how those things make a difference. So, how can we be able to look at this from a bigger picture? So bigger picture is there are stressors that are associated with pain parts. You have other areas besides the ones that I'm focusing on. You have the amygdala. You have parts of the autonomic nervous system. You have the anterior cingulate cortex. I know I'm using fancy words. Just bear with me. But then you can see this yellow that's listed here, the last one the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, an area of the brain that really helps to decrease pain. So the question is, is as we're having this change that's taking place in gray matter, and that area may be able to help improve our pain, but it decreases in size, does it make our pain potentially worse as, that, as pain is kind of attacking it? And that's a problem. There are some theories about how this might be able to be addressed um, some that are a little bit non-invasive, if you would. So an article such as the following that looks at from Newsweek that talks about, hey, your brain is shrinking as you age, which is a gray matter reduction, either naturally or that can occur regularly, right? So it talks about a number of different things that that really sort of um, talk about that those cellular losses. But at the end of the day, some of the things that have been mentioned are things like exercise, meditation, vitamin B treatments, right? Well, that's one way to potentially be able to go about it. The other way to potentially go about this is by things that we've talked about before that may have some benefit, not saying that it's going to change your gray matter specifically, but it may be able to help improve your cognitive function. It may be able to help improve your mood and possibly it may be able to improve your pain. And so those are things like TMS, where we see again, this prefrontal cortex that's in place 
and we can see that there's interrelations of these things that we just talked about, things like the amygdala, the anterior cingulate, and how they connect, and how by hopefully being able to improve the function that's there, maybe we can be able to improve some other things. So, you know, if we can be able to take that and have those symptoms not be prominent, perhaps we can be able to improve some other things. So for those of you who are joining us live, if you have questions, by all means, jump in and ask. But at the end of the day, what we really want you to be able to know is that there are ways to be able to preserve your brain, ways for you to be able to be aware that this is something that can be happening to you. And at the end of the day, we want you to make sure that you can be able to be able to say, thanks brain, I love Sheldon, um, to say, all right, how can you be able to make sure that you can stay as healthy as you possibly can not be aware of something that's causing you a problem that you don't know anything about and make sure that your pain isn't causing you other problems which are circular in nature thank you for joining us as always always appreciate you joining us i know that right now for many people this is really a tough time depending on where you're at you may still be kind of having that snow that's just getting after you and so hopefully is starting a lesson. We can get back to being able to do the things that we want to be able to do. And we appreciate you joining us every week um, and your support. If you found value uh, with this video, please hit the like button, maybe share it with somebody that you think this might be of value to them. And then also, hey, subscribe to our channel on our YouTube channel um, if you're interested in learning about other topics like this. Really appreciate you joining us always. Thank you so much and have a great day.